Hello and welcome back everybody. Today's session begins exactly where we ended the last time. Now, you should recall from the last session that the English Civil War had taken place, Parliament had won, uh, King Charles I was beheaded, and in the end, Oliver Cromwell removed the rump Parliament and seized power to rule as a military dictator. That's precisely where we ended, and that's exactly where we begin today's session on the Restoration and the Glorious Revolution. And so when we look at the essential questions, we want to kind of treat this the same way that we did last time, okay? We've got the essential questions surrounding, you know, the subject matter and the event, and then we've got the big one down at the bottom that we really want to be thinking about. As far as the Restoration is concerned, uh, what is this thing? What is this time period? What is going on in England during the time that we call the Restoration? And during this time, how does Parliament increase its power and further limit the monarchy in England? Okay, then we get into the Glorious Revolution. Well, what the heck is that? How can a revolution be glorious? Well, we'll find out. Let's find out what it is. Uh, and how do the actions of King James II lead to this event taking place? And what does Parliament do that leads to this quote-unquote revolution? I use the air quotes. You'll see when we get there why that'll make sense. Now, and after it's over, how's the English government different than it was before the Glorious Revolution? How's the power structure shifted? How's the balance of power in the English government changed? Okay, and as, as you're looking at all of this, listening to all of this, watching all of this, be thinking about the big question at the bottom. How well does this event align to the philosophies of the Enlightenment? How well does this adhere to the ideas of classical liberalism? That's the big theme. Be thinking about that as we look at this whole event. All right, keep that in mind. So those are the essential questions. Without further ado, let's get this party started. All right, so Oliver Cromwell, he removed the rump parliament from power in 1651, and until his death in 1658, he ruled England as its military dictator, enforcing very, very strict Puritan religious rule in England. It's a very miserable, pretty unfun time to be living in England. But nobody lives forever, not even Oliver Cromwell, and eventually he dies. And after his death, his son Richard becomes uh, the new leader, the new ruler, if you will. But he's not as strong as his dad, and quite frankly, after all those years of strict Puritan rule, the English people are tired of it. And Richard's not able to maintain control over England. Uh, the English people, they, they kind of rise up and they remove poor Richard from power. And uh, once he's gone, once he's out of power, they hold new elections. They put a new parliament in place, and the very first thing that new parliament does when they take their seats in 1660 is they vote to put a king back on the throne. They vote to restore the monarchy in England. And that's exactly what the Restoration is. The Restoration is the time period uh, in which the Stuart dynasty is restored to the throne of England, and to restore a king to the throne, you need to find the next closest relative of the old king. And uh, the oldest son of Charles I, also named Charles, gets recalled back to England from the European continent to take the throne and become the new king, Charles II. He'd been on the run for a while, ever since the English Civil War, so you can imagine his excitement when he gets the call to come back home. And so Charles becomes the new king, Charles II, and the English people celebrate wildly at the restoration of the Stuart dynasty to the throne. Uh, you have to picture in your mind, you know, the, the celebrations you get in the streets of a city after a team wins the Super Bowl or wins the World Series or wins the Stanley Cup or, or whatever. It's, it's that kind of happy. It's that kind of celebration because it's like this breath of fresh air and a weight finally lifted after those years of very strict puritanical Cromwellian control. And so now the Stuart dynasty is back on the throne. And Charles II is often referred to as the Merry Monarch because He's generally a pretty jovial guy, liked to party, loved good witty conversation, enjoyed a drink now and again, uh, and, and so he really symbolizes this return to a happier, much more normal life, if you will, after the, the years of strict Puritan rule are gone. Oh, restoration fun fact for the day. Uh, in sort of the fervor and celebration of the restoration of the Stuart dynasty, uh, old Oliver Cromwell's body was dug up and put on trial for high treason. And the dead body was convicted of high treason and sentenced to be drawn and quartered. So the dead body was hung and then dismembered, and its body parts uh, spread over different parts of the city of London uh, for people to see. And the head, I believe, made it to the uh, London Bridge if I'm correct. And hey, today, if it's on your bucket list to go see an icky severed head, you can see Oliver Cromwell's icky severed head in a museum in England. 
there's your restoration fun fact for the day. Uh, speaking of the restoration, though, I mean, this is a time with when Charles is uh, in power, Parliament is further asserting its dominance, placing more limits on the monarchy. Okay, uh, they've kind of finally managed to get their hands on that power and and limiting of the monarchy that they that they weren't able to do previously. And I mean, you put yourself in Charles's shoes. Even if you don't agree with all the stuff they're doing, you know what happened to your father, and you don't want to go down that road. And so Parliament is really asserting its dominance here under the reign of Charles II. And uh, things like the Petition of Right joins the Magna Carta to become part of the English Constitution. The Petition of Right is actually something that was signed into law under Charles's father, Charles I. But see, he used it as kind of a political ploy. Parliament wouldn't give him the money that he wanted. And they said, well, we'll give you the money if you sign the Petition of Right. He says, sure, I'll sign the Petition of Right. And then they vote and, and grant him his taxes. And then he immediately dissolves Parliament and starts ruling as an absolute monarch. So... Pretty underhanded, but pretty clever. Well, now that's it's, it's officially added to the English Constitution uh, under the reign of Charles II. As, as you look at the things that fall under the Petition of Right, this is nothing new. These are things that really had kind of been around since uh, the Magna Carta almost. Uh, Parliament later adds the concept of habeas corpus, which is to ensure that a person can't be held in prison or punished without a trial or just cause. Again, that's something that's been around since the time of the Magna Carta, but, you know, English kings had, had abused and not abided by this, and so this is sort of reiterating it and putting it down on paper in the documents that make up what is today the English Constitution. And so we have a parliament that is uh, further asserting its power and further limiting the strength of the monarchy during the reign of Charles II. But, you know, Charles doesn't live forever, and after he dies, uh, his brother James becomes the new king, King James II in 1685. Problem here, though, is that James is a Catholic, and Catholics tend to believe in divine right. And despite what happened to his own father after the English Civil War, James tries to claim divine right and tries to reestablish absolutism in England. He ignores the laws, he tries to rule as an absolute monarch, and, and we know this just didn't end too well last time. I'm not sure why he thought it was a particularly good idea, but he does try to go down that road again. And, you know, if, if your parliament... You're not really sure what to do here, because clearly you're very alarmed by the actions that James is taking. But, you know, you don't want to go down the road of another civil war. Everybody remembers what happened there, and it's not something anybody wants to revisit. And on top of that, you know, James is already a pretty old guy, and Parliament thinks that if they just wait long enough, he's going to die. And after he dies, his Protestant daughter Mary would be next in line to the throne uh, because English uh, succession law allows daughters to inherit. Protestants do not believe in divine right. Catholics do, so they figure if they can just wait the old guy out, let him kick the bucket, then their problems will be solved. Unfortunately, James kind of messes all that up for Parliament when his second wife becomes pregnant. People didn't think this was going to happen because he was really old, um, but he made it happen, and so wife number two is now pregnant. Okay, still not bad yet. I mean, if she gives birth to a girl, then Protestant daughter Mary is still next in line to the throne. As long as she doesn't give birth to a boy, everything will be fine, and of course what happens... She gives birth to a boy. Wow, what a good-looking family you have there. That's not a weird picture at all. Yeah, this is a big deal, because even though the boy is much, much younger than his daughter Mary, males always came first in the line of succession. And so this means, then, that the child would be raised Catholic, and you'd have a Catholic male would take the throne, you'd have another Catholic king uh, who would most likely believe in divine right and try to rule as an absolutist, and then you've got the whole issues of the potential of another civil war all over again. Well, knowing what this would mean for the future, keen to avoid another potential civil war, Parliament finally steps in and takes action. It's drastic, but they have to do something. Their solution is to invite James's Protestant daughter Mary and her husband uh, to, to just invade England, because she would have taken the throne anyway if not for the birth of the child, so they simply stepped over the kid uh, and went straight to the daughter and invited her and her husband to invade. So we have Mary and her husband, William of Orange. He's the ruler of the Netherlands. Oh, he also happens to be her first cousin. And when you look at the picture there, there is 
there's a little bit of a family resemblance. But be that as it may, this was, you know, this was relatively normal back then. Anyway, so Parliament sends them a letter and invites them to come and invade England and take the crown. And uh, James is obviously alarmed by this. Parliament has turned against him. Uh, the military turns against him. The population turns against him. And so seeing that he has no support in England, James vacates the throne and flees to France in 1688. William and Mary then cross the English Channel uncontested, enter the city of London without any resistance, and are crowned King William III and Queen Mary II in 1689. When William and Mary take the throne, this is what they called the Glorious Revolution. They called it the Glorious Revolution because this took place with no battles and no bloodshed. It was a peaceful transfer of power. That's what made this revolution glorious. And during their coronation ceremony, they do something that English monarchs hadn't done before. They swear an oath to uphold the laws of England and govern based upon the laws and policies set forth by Parliament. They don't, you know, swear to rule under God as they see fit. They swear to uphold the laws that already exist and to act within those laws. This is huge. Uh, it, it signals a huge shift in who's really in power in England. And during their reign, the first really big thing they do as the royal couple is uh, they sign the English Bill of Rights and add that to the uh, English Constitution. And so, really, what we're seeing now is the beginning of the process where English monarchs are becoming not much more than figureheads of their government. And supreme power is resting squarely in the hands of of Parliament. So after the Glorious Revolution, you can really see Parliament as being victorious in this long struggle for control as the monarchs rule with the permission of Parliament. The king can't raise and keep an army without Parliament. Parliament passes all laws. The king merely signs them and makes them official. Uh, Parliament still approves and collects all taxes. So the king is, is more like more like a, a chief executive than he is really a monarch. And, and over time, uh, the party that was in control in Parliament would have its top leaders kind of become the inner circle advisors of the king or queen. Um, they, they were called often uh, the, the cabinet of ministers. And the overall leader of the party in power in Parliament was what you would call the prime minister or the top minister. And today, prime minister is still the position of the person who's uh, the leader of the English government now. All right, so we saw the Restoration, and we saw the Glorious Revolution. The Restoration, of course, was when the Stuart dynasty under now King Charles II was restored to power, and, uh, and the, the Parliament begins to assert its dominance over the monarchy. Well, then along comes Charles' brother James, who tries to do that absolutism thing again, and Parliament will have none of it. This is where we get the Glorious Revolution, as they invited his daughter Mary and her husband uh, to come in and take the throne, after which, of course, uh, we saw that Parliament really reigns supreme. And so the big question we look at here at the end is how well does this revolution align to those philosophies of the Enlightenment? How well did this align to the ideas of classical liberalism? Think about that. Be ready to talk about that the next time that we meet. And as always, until that time, I bid you farewell.